Hello, everyone. Hey, I'm Evan. Um, I'm a co-founder of Mina Protocol. And we are a layer one that is working on zero knowledge proofs. And one of the main ways you can apply zero knowledge proofs is for privacy. And I want to talk a little bit today about what that unlocks for Web3. Um, I think a lot of the time Web3 has talked about privacy for private financial transactions or making things kind of more private. But it actually, I think, just like is very necessary for a lot of use cases we might just want to do. And I wanted to talk about that because I think it's important for where Web two, where Web three can go next in doing more than it does today. So, yeah. So I'll talk a little bit about why private user data is important. Then a little bit about uh, why zk is good for enabling this. And then we'll talk about some examples in practice using this on Mina that hopefully will give a good sense of how you might actually deploy this as a developer or end up interacting with it as a user. Yeah, so why private user data? So when I say private user data, I really mean any data that you wouldn't want to share publicly. So this isn't um, just making things, um, you know, private financial transactions or whatever. This is, you know, all the things we're already used to being private on Web2. Like we don't expect our healthcare data to be leaked everywhere. We send private messages expecting they will stay private. Uh, we, you know, use apps for location and we don't expect it to be known where we're going all the time. And some of these unfortunately are semi-public if you, um, you know, if people are tracking them, but at least it's hard to get to it as an individual. I can't just like get this information for someone random that I know in, in the crowd or whatever. Um, so we're used to this in web two. This is like a thing that we use all the time when we're interacting with these applications. And you can imagine if we're wanting to build a web three application, it would be nice to be able to interact with some of this data without it suddenly becoming all, uh, you know, public. And this is super easy to do in web two. We just trust a centralized server with our data. Uh, you send your data to the centralized server. The centralized server stores your data along with everyone else's data in some big database somewhere. We hope the data doesn't get leaked. And uh, we can use our application. We can use our, you know, our, uh, your social media or like our, uh, you know, ride sharing app or whatever we want to do. And it's great. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't really work quite as cleanly in Web3 today uh, because we don't have trusted centralized servers to store this data, which is actually awesome. Uh, because we can build platforms that are open, that don't have uh, centralized providers. Uh, so that's all really great. But it has also meant that everything so far has to be public. And when you put your data on the chain, everyone's looking at it. Everyone's running that computation. That's how it kind of works. And this works for some things like DeFi, NFTs. We've seen these use cases come up. They work. They are very large now. Great. Uh, but there's still a lot of use cases that involve private data that we would like to be able to do that we cannot do in this paradigm. I wanted to like talk about like a semi real world example. I don't know if this is like how realistic it really is, uh, but I think like it gives a good sense of maybe why you might start wanting to think really seriously about privacy when you start building something that starts interacting with the real world. Uh, let's say we want to build just like a simple ride-sharing application. Uh, we want users and drivers to review each other. Uh, we don't want to just leak everywhere we've been forever. Uh, you could figure out where someone lives, for example, that way. Especially this is Web3. Uh, you might be able to uh, see who has a lot of crypto and then see everywhere they've gone. And that's probably not something that you want to do if you have a lot of crypto and you want to use an app like this. Um, so here's like a naive solution. Um, uh, you could store reviews on chain, but not the actual trips. Unfortunately, so you think like, okay, we're not putting the trips on chain, should be fine. This still has the issue that um, I can ask drivers to um, uh, offline share trip data, and they can provably connect that with the on-chain reviews. And so you can off-chain then connect everything back together and make everything public where you've traveled and everything. In fact, if there's like someone who has a lot of crypto, maybe I can even put a bounty up saying, if they use this app, send me their trip data. They won't know that you sent it to me. I will pay you for that. Um, suddenly, this is like very bad from a privacy perspective if we did this naively this way. So just an example we'll keep, keep in mind. We'll come back to talking about how ZK can help with it. 
so yeah, so zero knowledge is like this very cool primitive that can help with things like this. Uh, I think one way to think about it is if you know about like hash functions, public key cryptography, this is kind of like another crypto primitive, excuse me, alongside those. So it's very, you know, it's very cryptography um, crypto and uh, it's very powerful as well. It's like this very uh, general new primitive. And what it does precisely is it lets um, users construct proofs about information and share those proofs with other parties um, in ways that both make the proof uh, very efficient to check. So I can have a very huge computation. I can like have a computation that runs on, you know, my, my supercomputer for like, you know, a year or whatever. And it's still very cheap to check the proof afterwards. And also you can do this in a way where you hide the inputs and you only share constraints on the inputs. So I can say, for example, there is some data source that says that I am 31 or whatever. And here's a proof though that I am over 18, but I'm not gonna share my actual age. So you can share these constraints about the inputs without sharing the inputs themselves. So you keep privacy over, over those. Uh, and this is really great because now we can use these to selectively disclose facts, to verify things. It's a very, um, powerful technique when you're thinking about the kinds of uh, trust applications you would want uh, on the internet and with blockchain. Uh, just to give like a very simple example, uh, you could share a proof that you know of a number that when you square it equals 121 without sharing the actual number. It's kind of a trivial example, but for people that know more cryptography, you could share, for example, here's a proof. I know the pre-image to a hash, but I'm not going to share what the pre-image is. I'm just going to share I know the pre-image to the hash. And if you can do that, that's like a much more powerful operation that you wouldn't usually be able to do, but you can do with zero knowledge proofs. Uh, so very powerful for privacy, for efficient proofs of things, for selective disclosure of data. Uh, so here's how this would work in practice. Uh, we have our user, we have a browser, and we have inside the browser like a wallet. The, the little square in the corner is intended to be a wallet. And we have some private data that is in the wallet. And we would like that private data not to be leaked publicly and not to go out to the whole world. We want it to stay in our wallet and stay private to us. What we can do is inside the wallet, compute a proof about that data. That proof can then go to the web page, And then that proof can then be shared with the blockchain. So from the user's perspective, they have to trust their wallet, same as we do today with our private keys. But we don't have to trust the web page. We don't have to trust the blockchain. We've shared this data that we wanted to keep private. Um, well, we've shared the fact about it, but not the actual data itself. Um, and yeah, we've, we've been able to, to, to do that sort of operation. And there's a lot that goes into behind the scenes making this all possible, but at a high level from like a user and developer perspective, this is the kind of thing I think we should be thinking about when we're building these kinds of interactions. Um, yes. So going back to the uh, private rideshare thing earlier, the problem was that trips could be linked back to your on-chain account. And then from your on-chain account, it could be linked to everything else you're doing on crypto, all of your, the assets you hold, all of the other applications you interact with, everything is all linkable together. Not great. Um, but instead what we can do with zero knowledge proofs is we can share proofs about um, your rating, any of the proofs that are needed about your account, but without sharing the account itself or the underlying data. So I can say, here's a proof that you know, over all of my rides I have, I have like, you know, a four, four and a half, five star review or whatever, but I'm not going to share all the actual trips I've done. I'm not going to share my actual account data. It's all staying private. Um, and you can use the blockchain side of it to make sure that you're actually updating your ratings so that even if you get a bad review, you have to keep track of it. You can't just like skip that one. And uh, you can make sure that the state is all kept up to date. Uh, so between like zero knowledge proofs and blockchain, we could think about making platforms like this that are fully open that have privacy, uh, and uh, because of that, keep your sensitive information safe and unlock new applications that I think is, is important and cool. So some improvements here, like you know, no data leaks, which is a really good one compared to Web 2, uh, and it allows for applications just generally to be more private than was possible in Web 2. So that's all really good, but I think just in particular, like never mind like m more private, which I think is good and important, we can just unlock more use cases at all that use private data in some way, use identity in ways, use um, uh, keep, keep information separate in particular ways. You can just do things with privacy, which unlocks more applications. Uh, we've been kind of encapsulating all this in this idea called HTPZ. So similar to HTTPS, how like it makes sure that data is being sent securely between uh, websites. 
Uh, this is the idea of using zero knowledge proofs to build an internet that has more guarantees and has um, more privacy for your data and provides um, more trustworthiness uh, through zero knowledge proofs in MENA. So this is, I think, like kind of the, the top level idea that we're hoping uh, will be a thing is like you go around the internet and you are um, interacting with websites that have integrated zero knowledge proofs for privacy and have integrated zero knowledge proofs to be able to prove things about the data that's moving around um, on those applications. So uh, yes, this is, this is a thing we're hoping to make happen. Uh, I wanted to share some examples also in practice on MENA. So uh, MENA is currently at a stage where um, it is on mainnet and it offers like a um, proof of its blockchain for payments. But uh, there's about to be a uh, upgrade for MENA that will unlock uh, all these kinds of programmable applications as well, basically zero knowledge smart contracts uh, pretty soon for MENA's mainnet. And there's been a bunch of teams that have been building things that are kind of in this ballpark of, of privacy and uh, zero knowledge proofs on MENA. So uh, to share some that are actually happening right now, uh, one Punkpol, which is also uh, native to South Korea, which is super cool, is working on a private voting solution. So you can uh, have communities initiate votes on things and um, they can, uh, users can uh, vote on those platforms or indicate how they feel about a topic without actually, uh, uh, while well, keeping their vote private. And uh, this is really cool. They've actually found a lot of uh, really cool communities that want to use this, one being uh, one of the political parties in South Korea, which is like quite a cool integration uh, for them to do, I think. Uh, so there's them. There's another company, Tonic, working on private identity. So this is being able to say, uh, here is a proof that I have been KYC'd and uh, I'm not a bad actor with respect to like the current financial system and you can let me use this application, but otherwise keeping your data private. So saying I have been KYC'd, but otherwise I'm not gonna tell you who I am in particular. Uh, so that's really useful if you wanna build any kind of like identity thing that uses KYC. Uh, a team using this is called Lumina and they're building a private compliant DeFi solution. So using these proofs of KYC to build like privacy pools uh, where uh, you know once you're in the pool, you can transact privately uh, and do DeFi privately, but you also are keeping your identity private when you're doing that, which is really good for um, companies that might want to uh, do things on chain, but want to make sure that they're not interacting with bad actors when they're doing that. Uh, another one is this team called Biosnarks. Uh, they're working on private proofs about scientific data. Uh, so proving like I have a molecule that has these properties or other kinds of scientific data related things. So that one's also pretty neat. Uh, there's also a bunch of layer twos, or not a bunch, there's really like a few, but ProtoKit and Zeko are like the two biggest uh, right now who are building like uh, scalable, like basically ZK rollups for Amina, taking advantage of Amina's own like native zero knowledge proof functionality. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones, but that's just like a summary of some things that are being built using this kind of technology that can be built now that we have access to zero knowledge proofs. Uh, a couple things in development worth mentioning too are uh, EVM integration. So we want to make it possible to use these zero knowledge proofs from Ethereum, as well as prove things about uh, EVM state from Mina as well. So you could say, here's a proof that I own an NFT from this collection, but I'm not gonna tell you which particular one, or here's, another, here's some other proof about my activity so far on uh, Ethereum or any other EVM chain. And then also bringing that back over to Ethereum so you can then do things with it over there too. Um, and another one is this idea called ZK Passport. It turns out that passports have uh, NFC uh, in them. Most modern passports do. So you can scan your passport with your phone and get all the data about it. And that data includes cryptographic uh, signatures from like the nation issuing the passport. So you can use this to do um, both private identity as well as uh, proofs of personhood. Being able to do things like one person, one vote, for example, or this is a website where each user, well, you know, had a real passport they're not like an AI or something, uh, but uh, doing that in a way that's fully private and decentralized, you know, uh, making it so you don't actually have to give that website, you know, your passport information, for example, which I've seen actually is like a thing that I think LinkedIn is doing now. They want your passport information to do some stuff, but it seems better if we can maybe keep some of that private. Uh, I'll run through a couple examples of how these work in practice. It should be pretty clear from what we've seen before. For Etonic, for example, you go to Etonic's website, you complete their KYC, they then put an identity on your wallet 
that says, okay, I've completed KYC. The sensitive uh, credential information goes in your wallet. And then you'd go to Lumina. And Lumina then says, okay, wallet, I need a proof that you've been KYC'd. And the underlying data never leaves the wallet. So it's, you're not exposing who you are to the browser or to the blockchain. But what you are doing is you're sharing a proof that you do have a valid KYC credential with the browser and with the blockchain. So you can use the application um, in a private way. Another example, uh, just using ZK Passport, is like, you know, user, scan, passport, upload passport data to wallet, and then share a proof about that data to uh, the browser and the blockchain. Uh, and you can make, for example, like a website that doesn't allow, um, uh, you know, non-human actors with the, in the intent of not allowing non-human actors on the application. Uh, it seems in particular, like probably uh, this is either already an issue or going to be uh, where the new AI stuff, you probably can create a lot of fake identities and make them deploy them to websites and use that for misinformation or propaganda or other things. So it seems very useful to be able to have some proof that you're not a AI and you are a real person, but doing that in a private way is also important. So you can build things like this also. This is like something that is like, you know, we're working on the specs for it and it should be pretty cool. Um, yeah, so just like, I just I think that's like it for like the main content. I just wanted to share, you know, like, so this the, some summary of like where to look for some of the stuff if you actually want to like dig into the code and start actually seeing what it's like to build with some of the stuff and with these ideas. Um, as I said before, like there's going to be this upgrade that's going to happen pretty soon. It's going to make all this stuff enabled on Mina's mainnet. And that will be very soon. Currently it's in like testnet people have been building, but soon it'll be in production. Uh, there's a few things to know about as well. Uh, one is there's this thing called O1JS and that's like Mina's, um, uh, zero knowledge native, but also in TypeScript, uh, smart contract language. Uh, so this is like equivalent to like solidity. Um, if come from that world. And uh, there's two other programs worth knowing about, ZK Ignite. It's an incubator for like zero knowledge applications. So if you wanna start building something, if you have an idea for some kind of private application you wanna build, this runs every quarter and gives funding, gives mentorship, gives support to people that are wanna build with this new technology. And there's another one called Navigators, which is like, you don't wanna build a full project yet, but you do want to start digging in and building with zero knowledge and experimenting with it. This is a program that helps you get started with that and offer some funding for it as well. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of stuff happening in the next few months with Mina with all this stuff. There's like, you know, all these EK apps deploying on Mina that do all these new things. There's the mainnet upgrade itself. There is uh, the EVM integration coming out and there's all this other stuff happening. So I encourage you to check out um, our Twitter, our Discord and our website to see more what's going on there. And I think that's it. So. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, and I don't know if we do questions or something, but I, I know I'm a little short in time, but we can also have a break. Take questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so if anyone has questions, happy to answer any of those. Do you have any questions? We're going to take impromptu questions if you have any. We have some time left. So any questions for Evan and for Mina? Privacy, ZK. <laughs> we can pick Evan's brain. <laughs> That's fine. Um, oh, let, let, okay. 혹시 마이크 혹시 어떻게 좀 가능할까요? Annie? Sure. Yeah, please do. Yeah, but. So, uh, yes. What would your advice? So, what would be what would be your advice to Korean developers or like a? Even non-developers who are interested in ZK stacks, where they should start from. Yeah, so I think there's like two halves to think about. There's the underlying proof systems themselves, and then there's like the um, libraries that let you build um, using those proof systems uh, without having to dive into the like specific cryptographic implementation details of them. So I would say like probably it's good actually to get started with things like O1JS where uh, you can start playing with the like conceptual ideas with it abstracting away all the proof system stuff. Now on the proof system side, I think that's where like, uh, it's, it's a lot of it is like uh, based in, you know, uh, uh, cryptography, t you know, you have to like have a bit of a math background and I would recommend there, like there's a bunch of blog posts that have been written on the various proof systems. 
I would look for something that has been written in the last year or two because they've changed a fair bit since like some of like the earlier content was written like four you know four plus years ago. Um, so proof systems, I would say like blog posts, like some math is needed for applications. I think like stuff like ONJS is cool because then you can just start playing with um, implementing programs and not having to dive into the detailed math side of things as much. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? 질문 혹시 있으시면 통역도 가능합니다. <웃음> 열심히 해보겠습니다. Um, questions? Easy questions? Anything's good? We have plenty of time, so. I mean, do you want to share anything else? Um, maybe, like, I ask a question. <laughs> um, is it your first time in Seoul, by the way? It is my first time in Seoul, yeah. I've been trying to invite you for such a long time, but how do you find it? Do, do you want to share kind of your, you know, impressions on, because you had an event as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's been cool to just be in Seoul, like, I like going to new cities and stuff. And I have liked it so far. It's only been like three days, but it's been good. Um, I think what's been cool is like, it's very clear, like, um, uh, crypto has like um, a lot of people thinking about it here, like both kind of on the developer and infrastructure side, but also like, I get the sense like that, you know, uh, people are already kind of used to it, at least on like the, the token side, um, generally in Korea, which like mm -hmm. is like super cool compared to like, I think a lot of other places where like it feels like there's like maybe like a really uh, small like uh, community of developers and infrastructure builders, but the general population maybe hasn't thought about it as much. So I think it's like super cool from that angle and like feels like things like like Punkpole, for example, there's like good opportunities for building applications because of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, it's, and it's good. Yeah, I know that you have also met with like DSRV, teams like that. And uh, what is your impression? Because like there's a lot of like validators um, infrastructure providers in South Korea as well, surprisingly. So um, I hope you had a nice uh, meeting as well. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, like I think like uh, it was the first time meeting them in person, like everyone in person. But uh, they, you know, we were working with DSRV for like a super long time. Oh, uh, yeah, right. That's right. It's like our, one of our early Day one. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, no, it's it's. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Mina is always welcomed in, in the Korean community. And I think the issue, like the privacy to the topic of privacy and the importance of privacy, I think has been less, um, how should I say, appreciated in South Korea, like relatively, because I think it's very new to us, the concept of like, protecting our own privacy, like private data, you know, information. I think in terms of, um, yeah, so I just wanted to like, ask you how we can kind of improve that awareness as well, maybe as an education or something like that. Like, I mean, for one, I, I saw that like when you use apps here, I think there is like a privacy protection law that exists like around like having to disclose details about what applications are doing with your data and stuff. So I think there, there's some stuff there that I think like is super cool and like very different than like the US already, for example. Um, I'm not sure. Like I, I think uh, a, a lot of it I think is on like I think like one of the things is like, yeah, a lot of it's on the developer side where like there's things like that you just might not use like applications that like you, you might not have been able to build unless you had privacy available. Mm -hmm. um, and I think on the user side, like you should like when you're using these applications, think like, okay, like am I disclosing like all the locations I've ever been to? Who am I disclosing it to? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like you're, you're building like this record over time. But I think also like there's forces like AI that are going to make some of this stuff happen like more quickly so um it'll all kind of come together but you know it's things like that <laughs> yeah i think the awareness is definitely getting um better and better um kate oh there's two more two questions we'll take two and then we'll, oh there's three uh quickly kate want to go ahead this is like quickly shout out oh to my could you... yeah so i'm sure there are a lot of founders and uh project leaders here at the events wondering what kind of partnerships you guys are looking for in 2024 yeah i think um really like i think teams that want to start using some of this privacy stuff is like a really big one like and it's not just like on mina like we're working like it's pretty close at this point like evm integration which is like basically bridging mina's tiny proof into other into evm smart contracts um so really it's like teams that want to bring privacy things um to their application is something we want to help make happen Last question uh, in the back. Just been waiting for some time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, quick question. Perhaps I missed it earlier. 
Um, is Mina opinionated on a proving system or are you able to swap that out just simply because the pace of ZK research, it seems like every five days there's a new paper. <laughs> yeah, we have a particular um, proof system. It's actually coincidentally called kimchi. Uh, we went with like uh, pickle <laughs> themes for our uh, proof systems. Um, so currently it's on the, the kimchi iteration of it. <laughs> Perfect name for soul. <laughs> so, oh, oh, Mike. It's not working. Do you want to come here? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think we're opinionated about like a set of features we want to have in our proof system. But one of the things we're working on doing is uh, making sure that you can write um, verifiers for other proof systems in our proof system. So like Groth16, for example. And um, I don't like there's some I think like there's a Groth16. Groth but uh, I think there's like some opinions about like like supporting like recursion, supporting like uh, some set of features in Mina's main proof system, but then we want to connect that into other ones as well, basically. Yeah. 